Good morning, afternoon and evening, and welcome to the first live session of the 2021 Water for Food Global Forum. In this session, we focus on our water and food systems. Less than two weeks ago, the United Nations Food Systems Summit was concluded in New York. This summit was the culmination of an ambitious effort to develop a vision for our glo global food systems to be healthier, more equitable, and more sustainable. For over half a century, the story of our global food systems has been positive, evolving to reduce food insecurity and meet the needs of a changing world. Yet we still have nearly a billion people food insecure, and this has come at a cost to our biodiversity, soil health, significant inequities, and of specific interest here are global water resources. There are also additional challenges, including continuing population increase, competition for economic growth from economic growth, degradation of resources, rural depopulation, and the increasing effects of climate change. By 2050, it is anticipated that more than half of the global population, around 5 billion people, will live in water-stressed stressed regions of the world many of which are the same areas that need to secure more nutritious food and in many cases have yet to establish the institutions and capacities necessary to sustainably manage the water resources they have. Reliable water resources and its management underpin our food systems, both in terms of the water needed to produce crops and livestock products and ensuring the resilience of those systems to water-related shocks. Water insecurity is one of the greatest threats to our global food system. While this, is, while this is usually acknowledged by decision makers in the agricultural sector, when we then operationalize investments in agriculture and food security, the availability and stewardship of water is often overlooked. We'll begin this session with a keynote address from Dr. Cla Claudia Sadoff, Managing Director of Research, Delivery and Impact and Executive Management Team Convener of the CGIAR, an international research partnership focused on reducing rural poverty, increasing food security, improving human health and nutrition, and sustainably managing natural resources. Following her keynote, Claudia will join a remarkable panel where each panelist will reflect on relevant outcomes from the Food System Summit and their own unique perspective on the interconnectedness between food systems and water. Our panel will examine the opportunities and challenges, highlight solutions and innovations, and consider modalities to scale actions to achieving sustainable impact. First, each panelist will provide a brief presentation, and then we will transition to a question and answer period. Please enter your questions in the Q&A tab at the top right of your screen, and we will address as many as as many as time allows. Thank you all for joining us today, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Cla Claudia Sadoff. Welcome, everyone. It's an honor to be invited to speak to you virtually at this year's Water for Food Global Forum. This is an important moment for the forum's deliberations. The United Nations Food System Summit has just been concluded with an unequivocal call to transform our global food systems. And the recent release of the IPCC Working Group 1 report has been described as signaling a code red for humanity. The report also recognizes that climate change is water change. From the IPCC report, we learned that every degree of global warming is likely to increase global mean precipitation by 1 to 3 percent. So confirmation that a hotter planet will also be a wetter planet. The frequency and intensity of heavy precipitation events of the kind we've seen recently in Germany and China have increased. This is easier to see where we have long-term observational data in areas like North America, Europe, and Asia. But it's equally clear that this trend of extreme precipitation events, often the cause of catastrophic flooding, is increasing globally. A warmer world is also subject to increased evaporation leading to decreases in soil moisture and the likelihood of more droughts. In Asia, the 10 major rivers originating from the Hindu Kush Himalaya that provide water and food security to large parts of Asia are glacier fed. Yet glaciers are melting almost everywhere. According to the IPCC report, from 2010 to 2019, glaciers lost more mass than at any time since observations began. These trends are only likely to intensify with every degree of global warming. 
And those that stand to suffer the most are very often those that are the more marginalized and resource poor to begin with. How we use our land and grow our food has also influenced the hydrological cycle. For instance, land use changes and water extraction for irrigation have affected local and even regional water cycles across some of the most intensively irrigated parts of the world, such as South Asia. All of this is to say that risks to and from water are among the greatest threats to global food and nutrition security. Access to supplies of water or an overabundance can make or break food production and consumption systems. Water risks will also impact our ability to adopt nutrition sensitive agricultural practices and meet the improved nutrition goal enshrined in SDG 2. In Sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, 50 million people live in areas where severe drought has catastrophic effects today. As climate change often manifests itself through increasing floods and droughts, the situation is likely to worsen unless drastic action is taken to mitigate water risks. Critically, we must understand the range of roles that water plays in food systems. First, water supply to the food system, the ecosystems and infrastructure that provide the resource itself store and regulate water supply. Second, water use in nutrition sensitive food production, agricultural water management, irrigation, water for aquatic foods and livestock. And third, water for food consumption, safe water for safe food, water sanitation and hygiene, and ensuring that health outcomes from food and nutrition. So, cognizant of these risks, it's important to understand that water can truly be a game changer for our food systems. Water plays an essential role in future-proofing food systems against climate shocks and other shocks like pandemics. Making them more inclusive and healthier, ending hunger and malnutrition, and safeguarding the health of our planet. Not preparing for managing water risks in our food systems is a risk the world cannot afford to take. I would now like to invite two of my colleagues from CGIR to speak in more detail about two specific themes, the management of water risks in food systems and the link between water and nutrition. Dr. Shakuntala Tilstead, the global lead for nutrition and public health at World Fish, was recently named as the 2021 World Food Prize Laureate for her research in developing holistic nutrition sensitive approaches to aquatic food systems including fisheries and aquaculture. She will speak to us about water management and nutrition. But first, let me invite Dr. Mark Smith, Senior Director of Water Systems at CGIR and Director General of the International Water Management Institute, IMI, to give some concrete examples of how we can manage water risks in food systems. Thank you, Claudia. It's a real pleasure to be able to contribute to this year's Water for Food Global Forum. In the few minutes I have, I want to share what we are learning at IMI about how to help farmers and food systems respond to the warning that Claudia sounded about the dangers that unfolding water risks hold for future food security. First, let's be clear. Water is very powerful. It can break food systems. And as Claudia said, the IPCC's recent report told us very clearly that power is growing. And we must now work more urgently than ever to mitigate water risks and build water resilience in food systems. So what can we do? This forum will help build the answers we need. At IMI and in the CGIR, here is what we are learning from our research. The key lies in harnessing the collective power of technological innovation, infrastructure improvements, enhanced access to data, and better water governance. At IMI, with our partners, we are focused on innovation that integrates these efforts. Our top priorities for technologies to lower water risks for farmers include farmer-led irrigation, solar irrigation, and wastewater reuse. We champion farmer-led irrigation through, for example, USAID's Innovation Lab for Small-Scale Irrigation in East Africa and West Africa. And our research not only aims to strengthen irrigation management and services, but also the markets, value chains, and policies that catalyze farmer-led investment ensure it is equitable for women and men. With the severity of the climate threat, it's also essential to gear up for investment in water infrastructure. But physical infrastructure alone cannot fully address water risks to food systems. 
while we can store water using engineered or gray infrastructure, such as dams, natural or green infrastructure, like wetlands or aquifers, is also critical. At IMI, we collaborated with the Global Water Partnership to quantify the global water storage gap. We estimated that worldwide we've lost 15 billion cubic meters of water storage since 1970, principally because of the loss of natural infrastructure. To respond, we are working with partners on delivering breakthrough gains in capabilities for optimizing strategic storage across bases. To achieve these kinds of breakthroughs, data are essential. Better data and better data access give us tools for managing tightening competition for water across sectors and the trade-offs among them. For example, as part of IMI's Water Secure Africa initiative, we're collaborating with Digital Earth Africa to apply state-of-the-art remote sensing and data management technologies to create open source applications to help farmers build resilience to floods and droughts. We also work with FAO, IHE and others to use water accounting technologies to help authorities monitor flows and reserves more accurately and to identify shortages and better direct water according to need. Data also make possible innovations for insurance against intensifying cycles of flood and drought. For example, we're helping to pioneer efforts across South Asia especially to utilize satellite data to make crop insurance more affordable and accessible for smallholder farmers. Finally, all of these innovations need good water governance to deliver the protection food systems need against water risks. Countries need support to realign policies, plans and water institutions to the challenges that a non-stationary climate has in store for the decades ahead. At IMI, we are, for example, helping countries in Southern Africa and South Asia to update groundwater policies. We're using learning from Myanmar and Tajikistan to help make local water user associations more successful and supporting Nepal to make the reorganization of water institutions inclusive of women. As never before, to create a resilient and water secure future for food systems and beyond, we must invest ourselves now in innovation for water systems that integrates the power of technology, data, infrastructure, and good water governance. We stand at an inflection point, and the decisions we make today will determine how resilient or how vulnerable the world's food systems will be as we weather climate-driven water shocks and stresses in the decades ahead. Thank you, and it's now my pleasure to give the virtual stage to Dr. Shakuntala Tilstead. Thank you, Claudia, for your kind introduction, and to you, Mark, for highlighting the importance of holistic water management solutions to build resilience in our food systems. Over 3 billion people depend on aquatic food systems for marine and inland waters, for food, income and livelihoods, and this figure is on the rise. We have heard the clarion call from the recently concluded UN Food Systems Summit. A holistic approach is needed to transform our food systems, both on land and in water. We are also reminded that these systems are not isolated. They are deeply interconnected with synergies and trade-offs. We now talk about aquatic foods. We no longer talk just about fish, as we now recognize the diverse range of animals, plants and microorganisms from all aquatic environments. Diverse aquatic foods are fundamental in our efforts to acknowledge the diversity of species and varieties, landscapes and diets in which these superfoods are produced, harvested, processed, marketed and consumed, and their benefits to nutrition and health. Aquatic foods are this generation's superfoods. They are powerhouses that provide multiple, highly bioavailable micronutrients, minerals and vitamins, and essential fatty acids, as well as protein, to meet the nutritional needs of all peoples. Studies have shown that the consumption of these superfoods, such as small fish, are crucial for cognition, 
development and growth in young children and for nourishing pregnant and lactating women and adolescents. However, we are yet to realize the full potential of these superfoods to benefit all people, especially the poor and vulnerable. In Bangladesh, we have promoted nutrition-sensitive homestead pond polyculture systems with large and small fish species. This resulted in increase in production and productivity, nutritional quality of the production, consumption of micronutrient-rich fish in women and children, and increased household income, as well as improved livelihoods and women's empowerment. We also developed and implemented innovative solutions, such as the molar gill net, for women to easily harvest small fish, and household and community solar drying tents to increase the access of nutritious, safe and affordable aquatic foods. In countries in Asia, Africa and the Pacific, we are working with communities to develop and use nutritious aquatic food products, superfoods, fish powder to be included in the diets of young children and fish chutney as a condiment in women's meals for nourishment. We will continue to define research priorities with an emphasis on diverse aquatic foods, for example, seaweeds. Drawing on the commitment of the UN Food Systems Summit and member states, as well as the vision and mission of the One CGIR, we now look towards strategic actions, such as the inclusion of aquatic foods in national food-based dietary guidelines and public procurement and safety net programs, such as mother and child health care and school feeding, as well as take-home rations. The one CGIR and World Fish Entity must position itself as a strong and trusted research partner, developing innovations and influencing policymakers, community leaders, investors, business leaders, and other stakeholders to position aquatic foods as superfoods as an integral part of the food system transformation for nourishing all peoples by 2030 and beyond. A clear conclusion of the UN Food Systems Summit Global Dialogue that took place in the run-up to the pre-summit in July was that by taking action on water systems, we can make critical contributions to transforming food systems. While the Paris Agreement on Climate Change is light on mentions of water, we have seen growing recognition in key international discourses, as evidenced in the IPCC report. Other examples include the Global Commission on Adaptation, launched at the UN Climate Action Summit in New York in 2019, which was an ambitious new initiative to combat climate change. The GCA report includes a chapter focused exclusively on water and mentions water's role in virtually every other chapter. And the new Global Food Security Strategy refresh from USAID shares a refreshed vision that now explicitly includes a significantly enhanced cross-cutting focus on water resources management. I'm optimistic that this growing momentum and a greater understanding of the need for water resources management will translate into strong commitments at this year's COP26. This would mean that governments and agencies will be better equipped to enhance collaborations to implement national policies and plans and facilitate opportunities for local communities to fund, implement, and scale solutions. Water risks are growing with particularly severe consequences for developing countries where risk factors are combined. And this is why a systems approach that focuses on the nexus between land, food, and water systems, together with other systems, for example, energy, is so important. Water system science is key to underpinning evidence-based solutions to managing the trade-offs between these sectors. It's this thinking that has shaped CGIR's commitment to a systems approach as set out in our 10-year research and innovation strategy. Achieving a balance of meeting human needs 
without exhausting natural resources will not be easy, but it is possible by treating food, land, and water as an interconnected system. The global challenges and reactions to the ongoing pandemic remind us of the importance of this systems lens, but also of the scale of ambition necessary to tackle complex global challenges. And with today's world facing more systematic challenges than ever before, we will need to apply the same level of determination that we have applied to addressing this global health crisis to the food, land, and water systems transformation that is key to human advancement and sustainable development. I wish you all a very productive and enlightening forum. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia, Shankuntala, and Mark for kicking us off and providing a great overview for this session. And many congratulations, Shankuntala, on the uh, upcoming award of the, this year's uh, Global Food Prize. Uh, um, very well deserved. Mark will now be, now be joining us for our panel discussion. If you have a question for any of these panelists, please type them in the Q&A box lo located at the upper right on your screen. Next, I'd like to welcome Harkamal Walia, our Kamal is a Water for Food faculty fellow here at the university, as well as a professor and Herman Chair of Agronomy in the Department of Agro Agronomy and Horticulture at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Har Kamal, you have the floor. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for this opportunity to join this uh, discussion forum. Uh, I wanted to bring a perspective of uh, uh, my research on water and the role of biodiversity and genetics in food systems. Uh, so I know Peter mentioned biodiversity before, so this would be a more detailed like, you know, dive in uh, on, a, on a microscopic level. So to begin with, um, you know, I'm going to talk about wheat, which is one of the major source of uh, calories for, for humans, and it's also the most widely grown crop in the world. So as we know that with irrigated agriculture, the, production, the productivity of land increases, which is shown here where you, know, you could pretty much double the, uh, the food production with irrigation. Uh, what we also know is that a large part of that uh, irrigation water goes towards making cereals, which for most of the uh, global population serve as staple uh, source of calories. So, however, the challenge is uh, with the limiting freshwater supplies and extreme events that we have seen some wonderful uh, but concerning uh, videos of uh, in the, uh, in the, in the, with the prior speakers, it's uh, a very big challenge. So what I am interested in looking at is one of the major uh, passageway for water is through the plants, and that's how the plants uh, uh, capture carbon and make food. So I'm looking at roots and how they adapt to uh, drought environments in wheat. Uh, as you can see from these pictures, you know, if you have a dry land versus an irrigated uh, wheat plant, the, 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 the change in the root response to water stress is pr quite dramatic. So this is the, uh, what I want to discover uh, from uh, these kinds of responses is what's the genetics behind it so that we could improve the, uh, the ability of wheat plants, for instance, to uh, you know, gain uh, more water during a water limiting environment and still produce. So the idea that we want to pursue is, that the, uh, is to look back at the wild species that are related to, uh, to wheat. Uh, these species are, grow in very harsh environments, uh, in for a very arid and hot environments, and they've reproduce quite well. However, uh, when we look at the modern cultivars that are primed for very high yield in uh, highly irrigated environments or in you know, very intensely cultivated in, uh, inputs, the, the genetic resources that have, could have ad helped adapt to the future climate scenarios and ongoing climate challenges may have been lost. So that's the I idea that uh, we were pursuing uh, with this work. Uh, so what we looked at was wild emmer wheat, which is uh, a, a, a wild relative of the durum wheat, uh, so for looking for more drought tolerance and its ability to uh, produce under low uh, en uh, water environments. So to do that, we made some genetic crosses to introduce pieces of the wild emmer genome into the cultivated uh, elite uh, uh, varieties for pasta wheat, 
uh, and, to, and we use then a series of technologies uh, uh, as part of international collaboration uh, with using some of the state of the art facilities at University of Nebraska where we use uh, high resolution imaging, multiple cameras and very high uh, resolution monitoring to uh, look at the responses of the plants. What this result yielded us was a um, uh, you know, uh, you get these images of these plants, but you also look at can look at the roots. What it yielded us was a set of plants that seem to be either very, very tolerant to drought or very responsive to drought. So one of those lines, uh, and I won't go into the detail, but it, one of the lines had a very dramatic uh, response to water stress. What it did was it makes a lot of shoot biomass and presumably also yields very high when there's plenty of water. But however, if you limit the water, the amount of uh, biomass decreases and it starts to invest a lot into its roots trying to mine the soil for water. So this was a trait that we did not find in, a, in the elite material uh, that's cultivated. To, uh, to, so, we, so that sort of gives, gives you a perspective of you know, the ability of using biodiversity and, yeah, and, the, and the reason to preserve that and so that we can breed crops that would be more adaptive to future challenges. So to give you an instance, I have a video that shows how and why this plant's actually doing better uh, than the, the well-adapted cultivar. If you look at that water uh, use uh, on a daily basis, uh, it kind of gives us a very interesting perspective because it shows that as the, uh, as the day starts, the line that has that uh, wild wheat segment of the, of the DNA seems to uh, open and start taking up water when it's m uh, more water when it's cooler in the day as opposed to the line uh, that's well adapted and used by farmers. So that sort of gives us a, a very good perspective on the importance of water, but also the importance of uh, temperature that in this case, the plants using the cooler daytime to take in a lot of water and uh, and move on. So that sort of gives you an instance of uh, how uh, you know genetics and biodiversity can help improve, uh, be a part of uh, s uh, the solution for you know having more adaptive uh, agriculture. Thank you, thank you, Har Kamal. We appreciate the the presentation. Uh, uh, just uh, as information, Har Kamal's team works on wheat, uh, rice, and corn, uh, maize. Uh, so three of the the major uh, grain crops around the world. Next, we will hear from Aaron Fitzgerald, Chief Executive Officer of the U.S. Ranchers and Farmers in Action. Aaron, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. So excited to be here on this important conversation of water for food and those last conversations that really set up the global um, real threat at hand. So at USFRA, um, we are fundamentally um, have a belief that farmers are key to the conversations on climate change and that we need to come together to co-create with our farmers the entirety of the value chain to kind of come together. We recognize that there are really, for our farmers, 30 harvests um, left. And another way to think about this is each growing season, which you'll hear from Ann and Rourke, it really is a chance to get it right. The stakes are high. Every time they're out there in those fields, they are taking risk with their businesses, with their livelihoods, and with fundamentally all of the innovation that's required to meet this grand challenge. And in 2019, we really created a call to action, a call in to leaders to really step up and work together to craft a common vision for the next decade to mobilize innovation, science, and leadership on where we are all going, because this next decade matters most to our farmers. Eight out of the last 10 harvest seasons here in the United States have been faced with extreme and episodic events. As you heard, a little bit of too much water, not enough. Um, the unpredictability that is really starting to face. In 2000, we worked on this vision for over two years and in 2020, despite COVID, leaders came together to align on this common vision. In 2021, this year on National Ag Day, we released and launched the vision and officially called it a decade of ag. As you've heard from many leaders on the global stage, that there's a need for a decade of action 
And when we think about a decade of action on climate change, we believe that that decade of action starts with the decade of agriculture. We now have close to 150 CEOs, presidents of, um, and chairs of different organizations who are joining forces and have endorsed this common vision. And of course, it is not enough just to have a vision. You have to have and mobilize actual transformation towards that vision. So we have three action tracks. One is ag mission or unleashing the power of science and data to rapidly get into the hands of our farmers over the next 10 years. The call to action of scientists and the public private sector to have an open format of data so that we can innovate faster as we think about climate adaptation. The second action track is really to recognize that we need fundamental transform transformative investment into this sector as we realize the real effects of climate change and our farmers ability to be a solution to the transition to a net zero economy. We want agriculture to be the number one place where green investment happens. And then the third action track is to really recognize the real people and lift up the amazing work that is happening as leaders in action for the decade of ag and to put stories in action, innovation in action of our scientists, of our farmers, and many of the brands who are working on this to get to scale. So excited for you to now hear from Ann Meese, my chair, who I work for. Ann, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thanks, Aaron, for that um, overview of the work that we're doing at USFRA. And I think I'd be amiss if I didn't also mention um, our work has also been in conjunction with making sure that the farmer voice is heard on the global stage. And so under Aaron's leadership and our organization has worked tirelessly to make sure that the farmer voice is heard at the food summit. And Aaron was invited to Rome at one of 100 um, representatives in the world to be the voice for US agriculture because we know how important it is that the food system begins with producers. So it, it's vital that farmers and producers have their voice where it matters in places like that. And then as a result of that, I was also asked to speak at the opening uh, ceremony of the Food Summit in September. And that was an awesome uh, honor and responsibility um, because again, um, we, we need that voice on that global stage when sustainable development goals are looked at and examined and um, worked on. You know, USFRA is unique in our strategic approach that we're not only gathering farmers and ag leaders, but also the entire food and value chain um, and companies together to unite under this common vision that we've created, the decade of ag. You know, farmers and farm groups are pretty effective at speaking within the ag industry, but the challenge is messaging and understanding what's going on throughout the food and value chain. And that's where messaging really matters. So over the last year as chair of USFRA, I've been in lots of conversations and heard major industry and food companies, and they are looking very closely at the ag sector for solutions for climate change. Um, you know, after all, farmers and ranchers are stewards and caretakers of the vast majority of natural resources like soil and water that we're talking about today here at this forum. Water, it's absolutely water is life and critical to growing the food systems that we have. But farmers are generally are just busy with multiple pressures and tight economic revenues. And farmers tend to as generally have this fear for outside regulations and influence from people who don't really understand our farming practices. So, but we all know that farming and agriculture does have the potential to mitigate climate change. And we can do this all while using less resources and providing more healthy, nutritious food. But utilizing this new technology and utilizing more climate smart practices is going to take partnerships and financial investments, which is what Aaron was just speaking about. Um, farmers have often 
put most of their energy or emphasis in making sure government programs provide the right financial incentives. But at USFRA, we're taking this unique approach and we realize there's this keen interest in the investment sector and private sector to invest in agriculture. And, you know, we need to get this right so that these can benefit um, all those in agriculture and society as a whole, a whole. So what these cost share programs or investments might look like is yet to be seen, but that's why collaboration is absolutely critical. So um, that's where we're working throughout the food and value chain to um, enable this collaboration, because we truly believe that to enable a decade of ag, we'll have a resilient, restorative agricultural system that could produce abundant, nutritious food and natural fiber and clean energy for that sustainable, vibrant, prosperous America that we all want. I, uh, to uh, Anne is the board chair of, of uh, um, Aaron's uh, US FRA. But uh, she's also, a, her day role is as a producer, as a farmer here, about 100 so miles north of, of Lincoln, where we sit. Uh, I, next up, we have another grower, uh, Rorick Pullman, who comes from the, the more western parts of the drier parts of the state. He's also an, an innovative farmer in terms of technology. Rorick serves on the Doherty Water for Food International Advisory Panel and is, is also the owner of or uh, producer uh, of Palman Farms. Rorick, you have the floor. Hey, you're muted, Rorick. Need to share my screen here. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. All right. Can you see my screen? Not yet. All right. There you should be able to. That's it. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, this has been great. Uh, I, I have enjoyed the, uh, the the global perspective, and and um, it really humbles uh, in terms of of where we sit as a landowner, producer, and and access to capital and to the resources, the equipment, the technology that that really brings to bear the, the, the significance of agriculture. And with that comes a responsibility. And that responsibility has changed in terms of prioritization of, of how we think of ourselves. And it wasn't long ago that you spent a lot of time on providing and making sure that your school and your local community and, and all of those things that are important to a, a vibrant uh, area that is very, confined and very welcoming to this whole connectivity piece, uh, data and, and social media and the expansion of that connectivity that allows you to, to really see and hear. You know, our, our contact was the local newspaper and a bit of, of the news was really, you know, what, what is happening with the basketball team or, or looking through the, uh, the um, local news that, that really kept us informed to today where we're concerned and able to understand what's going on all the way down to the microbial part of our farm, all the way up to the delivery points and the impacts of, of every aspect of our operation. And I wanna take you back to just a, a single day, a single time in a, in a farmer's day, and I'm gonna walk you through a progression that is, that is very, um, challenging to say the least because what we're asking producers all the way down to the smallholder uh, to that person that we saw early on in the uh, presentations all the way up to the commercial growers that that today can you know efficiently and 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 uh, manage to a level that that is just un, was unheard of uh, not so long ago but to keep it in perspective is 10 years ago uh, when I entered into the water world 20 years ago, but 10 years in particular into the data management and, and to the, the century ideas and these, these ideas about changing producers uh, or influencing practices in real time. But more importantly is uh, uplifting conservation and stewardship to a point that that now drives some of your investment. But more importantly is, is how you see yourself in your operation as that kernel of corn or that soybean or that simple bean
and I, that my introductory slide there is a fellow that we all know, but it, it is a different kind of thinking and it is a different way that we have to approach things. So let me advance this. So I want to talk about that system approach, but I'm going to throw nutrients in here as well, too, because it is I am also highly involved in the state of Nebraska's nutrient management on nitrates and phosphorus in our in our potable water, our drinking water. I've also worked across the, what they call the integrated management process in Nebraska that was instituted as a result of LB 967 uh, some time ago, nearly two decades ago now that Nebraska took this went right to the edge and said we've got to do something different so here's how here's our approach on our farm i am third generation i recently stepped aside for fourth generation our youngest of four children he's in his ninth crop i'm in my 39th crop uh this year and uh, he is he's taken on that leadership role so you're going to see a whole different level of connectivity and expectations about how we operate our farm so why why do we why do we talk about irrigation why do we talk about water and, and what does it mean in the, in the end game? Well, one of the things we did was we tied it to, to a one inch savings uh, across all the center pivot irrigated acres at the time in Nebraska. That looks like a pretty big number, but one inch was 10 year water supply for, the, for a city the size of Lincoln. And when you put that in perspective in a producer, that's important because one inch of savings to me is $6.50 an acre in energy costs that it takes to withdraw the water out of the Ogallala Aquifer. We sit on 600 feet of saturated thickness. I worked across six states on two huge USDA initiatives to look at and evaluate how to best look at and understand and evaluate the management of the Ogallala Aquifer. Save three inches. Lake McConaughey, you may not be familiar with, but it is the largest lake in Nebraska. It's man-made, it's an earthen dam. But save three inches, we can fill it one time. So it, that's a big deal across the, all the center pivot irrigated acres in Nebraska. So when this was taken at the time, there was a lot of conflict between surface and groundwater and about you know uh, timing and, and quantity and quality of this water. And, and a lot of things changed in those conversations because of this, this constant head knocking about water in Nebraska. We came to really gathering around a stakeholder driven process that has changed, that has changed our thoughts and our processes. So if we choose not to self-regulate, what does that mean? Well, innovation is continuing to occur. Demonstrations continuing. Also communication. Peer networks, how do you do that? We have a couple of projects. We have a master irrigator project out of Colorado that we're a part of, and also the TAPS project in Nebraska, te testing ag performance solution that it's a peer led network that start to help bring that innovation and those technologies and put them to the ground and actually, uh, <laughs> I, I, I get often frustrated with adoption. Innovation continues to occur, but our adoption levels are extremely low. They're, they're less than 15% with a lot of these things. And, and yet those are big acres because typically they're producers like ourselves that manage you know, larger acreages that, that the, the numbers make sense, the stewardship makes sense, and it's the right thing to do. So as we move on, we replicate, how do we expand it? And we aggregate it, look at watershed impacts. You can briefly look at this slide. I'm gonna come back to it, but this is a day in a farmer. This is our operation. This is a lot of the work that I've done across all kinds of places, but I want to take you through what it takes to look at the variability within our fields and look at them. And I'm not an optimizing, maximizing guy. I am an ROI guy. What does it make the most sense and set sustainable goals on our farm on production? I can grow 300 bushel corn here, which sounds really wonderful if you're a producer, but I lose money doing it and, and I actually tax the natural resource system to get there. So why, why would you do that? So you roll that back and look at energy, look at nutrient, look at genetics, look at equipment, but that all takes money and it's hugely capital intensive. You, you go from spending a few dollars or pennies per bushel, uh, a few dollars per acre and pennies per bushel, but in, in the big scope of things, it is extremely difficult to transform an operation overnight or even over two or three years, or even in a generational transition. It's expensive. It is a process that takes a lot of thought and a lot of direction. And so I'm really encouraged by the idea around climate change and nitrous oxide and, and greenhouse gas. I, I am really encouraged about thinking about uh, integrating with, with 
with machine and equipment dealers around equipment that that would help transform a producer to be able to help them understand. But but you really get into the complexity of soils. You get into looking at maps. You look at throw in elevation, throw in slope, then looking at similar soils, and then you start to create these 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 prescriptive ideas around how to run your farm. We do it all the way down to the sub meter uh, accuracy now, sub meter. And so we're producing over two terabytes of data per month out of our operation. And it's extremely um, uh, tough because it's managed in multiple silos of different providers and they don't talk together. It, the, the idea of, of aggregating APIs and, and so that they would talk so you could make better decisions in real time and create this, this kind of stakeholder driven success model that, that not only would influence stewardship and conservation of resources, but also the, the beneficial pieces to the environment and also to our own communities with seeding, with, oops, excuse me, and, and jumping over to prescription for each field. And then out of each one of those, what does it mean? All the way down to the water piece, tillage, my grandfather and my dad would have rolled over. They had to disc this two more times and chiseled it because the, the equipment at the time, it would have been nearly bare soil, but it, it could not manage that residue. It could not, you couldn't plant a crop in there and have a, a, a what, what I would consider to be an economic return that they could, they, they could live on. Today, we can do that. We can, we can precisely place things right to the sub inch. I can flip a quarter in the middle of 130 acres and mark that with a GPS and come right back to it and check that spot uh, in each and every one of my fields. We have these massive machines that, that have unbelievable accuracy, but we're also pulling the data. Uh, we now currently have what they call smart firmers that go in each row. So we're measuring the CEC and the, the soil integrity, the, the moisture, so that we have the highest success rate that we don't over fertilize or, or, or even put too many seeds on a particular soil type or region in your field. Each one of these takes a significant amount of, of technology and understanding and partners to help us. I, I wear all these hats, but I, I, I don't have a degree in all of them, nor do I profess to. Uh, have the knowledge to actually put in all of, in place all of these things, and then throw in soil health. I, I ro I'm rotator. I've been I've been cover crops for nearly 20 years, and I and I kind of smirk and I shouldn't about how this revolution of of how the expansion of of this idea makes a lot of sense. And and we've had to. I operate in one of the most restricted water basins in the nation, in the Republican. We've been under allocation of, of irrigation withdrawals for nearly 40 years. But what has that done? That has transformed our thought process on how we irrigate, how we responsibly understand and evaluate the, the, the application of groundwater on our farms or diversion of surface waters that are then applied. So I, was, I speak all over the U.S. I've farmed in South Africa and in Argentina and in Belize, and, and I'm not necessarily proud of each one of those. That was a prior time when, when the expansion of those ideas. But what it did do is put a perspective to me that, that how can we help everyone? How can we, in a forum like this, reach out and, and be able to tap into each and every one of these experiences to help? Drip irrigation. How do you reduce variable rate? I, I mean, we've heard it all, seen it all. And, and how do you optimize the, the application rates? But you create this, this, this extreme complex uh, validation or boots on the ground understanding of those changes and, and digital imagery. So I, I always like this slide as well. Harvest, we're right in the middle of harvest. We're behind me here about 300 yards. We're harvesting potatoes right now. We're harvesting corn and soybeans and and uh, pinto beans and and there's a lot going on so there's a lot of uh, stress in our lives right now and and trying to <laughs> impart it we always seem to have meetings during harvest so one of the things that we obviously are talking about is water uh we reach in deep into that pocket here in our own operation but it it, it is a systems approach each and every aspect of it so you see on the left the planned rate uh, on the right is the actual applied rate and you can see how specific that occurs and how much that we can see and, and extract from this data. Another one now that we've helped develop is a nitrogen application model. And so that is in, in tune or in sync with your water applications so that you're, 
we're very close to the uh, water utilization center, not far from here and, and working closely with them and, and how do you apply nutrients and at what level and how does that plant uptake and, and then uh, uh, spreading out those applications. You can see across here, there is five different applications. And then down in the bottom, there's this kind of gas gauge that gives us a risk estimate of just what, how, what, how much value does that application actually really put in perspective for us as a producer. This is becoming refined more and more and more. Uh, a lot of the recommendations for uh, corn or maize is 1.2 pounds of nitrogen per bushel of production. So that includes your soil, includes from the air and any type of precip that has any type. I mean, you can account for nearly every ounce of nitrogen that is applied on your ground, but understanding the complexity and its use rates in, in harmony with, with mother nature is the wild card. It's the big understanding piece. And so what we've done is we set goals of, of, of half of that, and then we set yield goals that are less than that. So let's assume that it's 220 bushel corn at six tenths of a pound of nitrogen. That's only 132 pounds of applied or, or aggregated application uh, inventory of nitrogen. That's an amazing, remarkable change in how things have been looked at. Same with phosphorus, but I'm going to flip it over because here's, here's how it's got to occur. All of these factors are part of that decision. Each one of these influences what's going on. But more importantly, how do you measure it and then get that measurement to a producer? When I've, heard, I've worked with probably 50 startups and still a part of probably 10 others that have the next best widget. And I, I chuckle every time because uh, they, they've got this sensor that's going to fix everything. And, and I said, OK, start your clock. And uh, hopefully they have a watch on and and uh, they start and we go into their their probe or their their telemetry sensor or their their weather station. And I say, stop. And generally it's about 90 seconds. And I say, take that times 50. Well, why would you take that times 50? I said, well, let's assume that it's a producer that has 50 100 acre fields and Take, uh, there's no way that he's going to look at that. But even roll that back even to a small stakeholder farmer that has 50 different crops in three acres. That, how the complexity of what you're trying to create, and yet how do you step that up and put it into their hand in real time? The, I, I call that all background noise from a producer standpoint. I, I, give me red, green, and yellow in my hand or in that smallholder's farm's hand that says, okay, here we are. And, and the, the, the green is great. You know, red is, whoa, let's pay some attention to it. Maybe that green bean patch over there needs some care. Maybe it's got a, a, a vine borer or it's got some kind of foliar disease or something that can be taken care of. Or in our instance, maybe it's just a hailstorm and you've got significant damage and, and you need to go out and either A, do something less about applying things to it or B, give it some extra attention. But it has to be something in real time, something that really helps influence and, and help that farmer through their day. So I'm gonna skip through these because this is data and this is crop stage and understanding water and how the plant takes it up and what growth states to do that. Understanding the daily evapotranspiration, matching up irrigations to it. I cannot pump this much water. So you have to borrow from the ground and pray that mother nature reaches in and helps you out. This is from July 18th all the way through August 17th and this is significant. These are big water uses. So that's whether it's rain fed or irrigated, that, that, that's the crop use for that day. So how do you extend it beyond that? Again, precip, irrigation, weather, huge deal. Field level weather, huge, huge deal in influencing irrigation and water management, huge deal. The, these models that they have, they're sometimes they're, they're not good for 30 miles. And I'll tell you across our, our fields, uh, it takes us 146 miles to drive in and out of every field. So you can imagine in a rain event what that means. There's no way to check rain gauges physically and stop irrigating. So what we've gone to is a, a very sophisticated weather station piece that with 2,500 rain event anywhere, we can shut down and, and not irrigate for a full 24 hours. Those are some of the strategies that we look at. Look at all the what ifs. I'm telling you that this is just, again, in, the, in, in that day. And, and does any of it have an ROI for my farm? We don't have your answer, but this is ours. So I'm going to go back to that very first slide and really capture the full day. All of that stuff that I just talked about, 
and I'm going to do it with pictures. And here's even some ground truthing, you know, by hand. Here's a water meter. Actually, we measure every gallon of water that is withdrawn on our farm, every gallon. And that is extrapolated back into what we do on the production side. But we're also one of the highest hail rates in the nation. We get hail nine days out of the year. So we have to really understand that with only 18 inches of annual rainfall, we're semi-arid here. So we have to have irrigation. So here we go. All of that stuff, I'm going to sum it up in one slide. And you get to take a look at how all of this stuff comes back to this guy right here and figuring out how to, to address the, the global issues and bring that all the way down to what they and how they influence their day and their decisions and their conversation. It's huge. It's a tall task. And, and I think we're getting better at it. I think the conversations and, and, and our perception from inside, also from the outside, is how do we, how do we make that a better, better equation and build that stakeholder and more importantly, that trust. It, it's all about trust with, a, with an owner operator is who, who do you trust and how often do you trust them? But more importantly is how do you get them to the table to be able to do that? Because now what's happening, the regulatory reporting is becoming very taxing. It all comes right back to that same people, that grower, consultant, trusted advisors. So now we got to have sales. Now we got to have inventory. We got to have everything else, marketing, <laughs> now traceability. Everybody wants to know where their food supply came from, what's your water footprint, what's your carbon footprint. Um, I got my carbon scores back. We, we have done a microbial biomap on our entire operation, and we're working on some really cool benchmarking stuff with the EU through the Global Soil Health Initiative uh, with a really benchmark report and uh, working with a lab here in Nebraska about how do you, because no one can tell me where I'm coming from, but they've got this grandiose idea about what I can do with carbon. I got all my carbon scores back and mine are so high because of our rotation and our adaptation to these processes. I don't qualify for any payments. So am I penalized if I, if I decide not, if I, if I choose to discontinue something like that? Well, that affects my water, my water infiltration rates, my water holding capacities. It, it's an incredible system approach. So it's, again, the processor is asking that question. The buyer is asking the question, but this person is driving the bus. And, and they are asking some very interesting questions and, and we're answering the bell at Palman Farms. We actually are taking that to the next level. Uh, we are actually developing all of these conversations into an end product that uh, we hope can uh, be able to trace that. And is it blockchain? Is it, you know, what is it? I don't know where all of this is gonna land, but, but take, take, take that snapshot right there. And we're asking for, for this much this much of a producer's time and, and take this out of his day to, to answer the bell in conservation and stewardship. They're going to do it, but we have to help that. We have to be able to insert ourselves, see it through their eyes and meet them where they are. Again, I'm looking forward to the rest of the, of the, of the conference. Uh, this is an amazing, amazing piece of, of effort uh, to be able to pull this off. So thank you. And I look forward to, uh, Hearing from Melissa. Thank you. Thank you, Rorick. Thank you for that n deep and insightful uh, um, uh, presentation on, on, on the, the position on, on the farm and, and how it connects into the food system. I think the, the message there around how do we integrate all this data and information that's actually usable by the farmer, and this is a question that translates around the world to, to, at, at all different scales. Lastly, we're very excited to hear from Melissa Ho. Melissa is the Senior Vice President from Fresh, for Freshwater and Food for the World uh, Wildlife Fund in the US. Melissa, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you see the slides and also yes. Yes. hear me? Great. Yeah. Rourke, wow, thank you. I, the forward-leaning innovation, passion, uh, and vision you have for uh, what you're doing to transform your your farm system was really incredible. So I definitely will be following up with you. Um, so thanks, Peter, uh, and the Doherty Center for uh, the invitation to join this really distinguished and diverse panel. Uh, and what a great and timely topic. Um, I don't know if it's the easiest uh, or most challenging thing to go very last at the end of such a, a really interesting uh, and again, diverse panel. I think um, you know I, our colleagues really set the global scene, the sense of urgency, 
uh, the opportunities and challenges at the big picture level, and then have really appreciated uh, Aaron and Ann and Rorick uh, bringing back uh, the farmer's voice and really, you know, honing in on the people side of this. Uh, I think I'm going to give you my takeaway. I know we really want to have time for discussion. I'm going to give you my takeaway um, from, from what I hope to accomplish in, in the few minutes I have at the top. So I think all of that is important. There is this big picture and then we need to bring it back and, and really talk about what it matters for, for the, the people, the farmers on the, on the field, but also the people in the landscape. So my top line takeaway for those that don't know us or, or you know, WWF, um, we are a conservation organization more than 60 years old. We work in over a hundred countries and we really are seeking a world where uh, people and nature thrive. And so we're looking at conserving biodiversity, critical landscapes and seascapes, and the ecosystem services that sustain not just the wildlife in these landscapes, but really the people. And this is the idea of sustain for future generations. So I think that is what uh, we really emphasize that we need uh, these natural systems and these ecosystem services to survive. It's not just that we're doing it for, for wildlife or for nature's sake. And so over, um, I think the other piece I'll just let me just dive in and say that um, one of our main things right now and our top line agenda is elevating the role of what nature and biodiversity means for this planet. So we know there is a climate crisis, ag, water and food are at the center of that debate now, which is great. The UN Food System Summit was really a piece of that. But we really also need to not forget about the crisis we are facing around nature. So freshwater species, for instance, have declined by 84% on average since over the last uh, four decades, uh, even higher rates of, uh, of um, loss than terrestrial species and marine species. Uh, and a lot of that is what our freshwater and food team at WWF is focusing on. The two biggest uh, drivers of loss of nature are agriculture and infrastructure largely due to habitat conversion and change, but also due to pollution and really appreciated Rorick, you bringing up uh, the water nutrient soil connect. Uh, it's not just water consumption and use, which definitely is that, but it's also uh, the runoff, the, um, you know, all the other things that are, are uh, at play when we think about agricultural landscapes. And so again, we know there's an urgency in climate, but you know, we had alarming reports recently in the US and abroad of you know, the species extinction. And what that really is sounding is a red, red warning lights flashing of you know, ecosystem services and, and um, you know, collapse. It's not just the species themselves, but it's representing a functioning planet. Um, and again, I think uh, really elevating where water plays a critical role between all of this. So, the next thing I'll say is the in the UNFSS, um, there were five action tracks, lots of different consultations, 18 months of hard work, thousands and thousands of meetings globally, regionally, uh, sector wise by stakeholder. WWF led action track three, which focused on nature positive production. Um, we uh, had thousands of game changer solutions. We funneled them into 12 different work streams and we really organize them across three lines of protect, manage and restore. And again, this is really our play of where and why we think we need to integrate now. These are not separate silos of what we want for development agenda and ag and food security, poverty alleviation, et cetera, and the SDGs versus what we want to achieve in the, in the Convention for Biological Diversity for Nature or COP26 for climate. We need to have one unified agenda. So by doing this, this is how we have framed what food systems transformation should be under a protect, manage, and restore frame. So I'm going to just give you a highlight of three examples, one from protect, one from manage, and one from restore, of what that would mean on the ground and some of the things we put forth. And, and so again, I'm, I'm much more representing not just the entire, not, not, not really the entire action track because there's so much there and I don't have time to really present uh, all of the game changers uh, from that, but really what WWF put forth in, in advance of the UNFSS. So the first was uh, rivers for food. So under the protect theme, um, in advance of the UNFSS, we launched a report called Rivers of Food, uh, as well as a, a microsite, an interactive website that really reinforces why 
conservation of riverine and freshwater ecosystems is so critical for food security and food production. So things that we kind of know, but maybe we forget uh, because we also in this report demonstrate how um, how undervalued rivers are and how poorly managed they are and how much freshwater ecosystems are truly at risk. And then again, exemplified by the incredible loss of biodiversity, 84% over the last 40 years. So a third of global food production depends directly on rivers, 40% of fish production, both wild capture and aquaculture fish production, 25% of global irrigation is actually from surface waters and delta systems like you know, the iconic Irrawaddy, the Mekong, home to hundreds of millions of people uh, and a significant percentage of food production. Um, and then obviously other things like flood recession agriculture, you know, tens of millions of hectares. And then just the, the populations and people that depend on these systems are, as others have mentioned, you know, often the most at risk and vulnerable and smallholder uh, farmers. So that's one thing I just wanted to highlight that protection of rivers is protecting food supply. And, um, and we, we often forget that. The second thing I wanted just to really at a high level call out under the manage is land use and land use change. And really WWF has worked very hard over the last decade plus with many others uh, in partnership, uh, including the private sector and producers themselves on land conversion. Um, and so I think the really important story here is while we've heard so much about the technologies to drive efficiency and better decision-making on fields, on farms around the world, and then in Nebraska, we also wanna know what the boundary conditions are on how do we know that's enough and what are the limits of uh, where these agricultural systems sit in the broader landscape uh, and in uh, you know, the, the broader situation of what's happening globally in terms of degradation of critical landscape hotspots for biodiversity, as well as for the ecosystem services that I mentioned. So here at home, we just last month launched our annual plow print report showing the drivers of conversion. Conversion of land has huge consequences for water. Uh, municipal water systems have been taxed, you know, millions of dollars. We've seen this um, in not only in the Midwest, but also in, in the Great Plains, but in the California context uh, with um, pollution, sediment, et cetera, taxing rural water infrastructure. Uh, but we know all of the runoff of, um, of, of agricultural waste coming off has a lot of other costly um, implications. But we also, in the Brazil context, so over 2.6 million acres of grasslands have been converted in this year alone. Um, it's uh, more than the rate of conversion in the Amazon tropical rainforest. We also forget that grasslands as a biome are an incredibly important ecosystem for carbon storage, for livelihoods, for biodiversity. Imagine our Great Plains were the Serengeti of North America. You know, great, we don't always call them by the same name around the world, but grasslands ecosystems uh, deserve to be saved and, and, and considered just like tropical rainforests. Um, and the other one I will mention that WWF and others have worked on and has gotten quite a bit of attention is the Cerrado in Brazil, another savanna grassland that has been in, in less than you know, 10, 15 years converted 50% and it's 45% you know, of the headwaters of Brazilian uh, river systems that feed into the Amazon and other places. So the land water connect is critical and land, managing land use change is, is a really important uh, piece to consider when we're thinking about uh, water food connect. Okay. The next one I will mention is the Rio Grande Rio Brave and really on restore. Um, what I wanted to highlight here, not just in this landscape, but in so many others where there's a huge dependency of agriculture, not only on surface water, but on groundwater. And Rorick, you gave a great example of when precipitation declines or you can't depend on that in the surface water. And we are seeing that all over the, the West, uh, not you know, half of the country practically. Um, there's been an increasing dependence on groundwater. Uh, and it's expanding, not just because of declines in precipitation where surface water was the primary irrigation, but also it's just expanding into semi-arid areas where surface water is not even available. And we see this issue of climate change really exacerbating it and the over allocation and use by people exacerbating the climate outcomes too and drought. 
So I, I just really want to, you know, the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo is a forgotten basin in this country. We think of the Colorado, we think of groundwater in California, but we forget about this uh, agricultural basin and really um, managed, highly managed, highly, highly over allocated. So um, there's lots of groundwater depletion. There's lots of uh, commodities being grown for feed. Uh, for uh, specialty crops. And so I think what we need here is a, a look at what and how to put some um, limits and restoration of environmental flows to the systems because we're depleting them beyond recovery. And, 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 and I, I loved work. I almost used the quote from Einstein um, that you had, we cannot do business as usual here. I'm glad I didn't because instead the last quote, quote I just wanted to end on is uh, from Sandra Postel, who's been a huge water champion and advocate uh, for decades and was this year's Stockholm World Water Prize recipient. And let me just end with this quote. The 20th century was the age of dams, diversions, and depletion. But the 21st century can be the age of replenishment, the time when we apply our ingenuity to working with nature rather than against it. With droughts, floods, and wildfires poised to worsen and spread, Investing in a healthier water cycle may be the best insurance policy money can buy. So we really need to be thinking of working with nature when we think about ag, climate, uh, and food systems. Thanks so much. So thank, for the, thank you for the great presentation and, and bringing us back to the ecosystems and the rivers. Uh, the ecosystems are really the canary and the coal mines of, of uh, the, the work we do. Uh, and now that we've all received a, a bit of context for, for this discussion. We have some time for questions with Mark Harkamal, Anne, Aaron, Rorick, and Melissa. I'll kick this off with a couple of my own, but feel free to put any questions in the Q&A box uh, located at the upper right on your screen. We have a few, but there's, there's time for more. My colleagues will be monitoring the Q&A box and we'll get to as many questions as we can today. So to start off, and I, I will just uh, uh, Ask the, the, these questions in, in the, the uh, in the order of the uh, uh, the presenters. So my, uh, first to Mark, I'll go to Mark. Uh, uh, Mark, given uh, this is a question to all of the panelists. Given your perspective, um, uh, particularly, what do you view? We've, we talked quite a bit about the challenges and opportunities, but really to bring out the the, the very specific challenges you see, the, the very high high level challenges, but also the opportunities. In, in this interconnection between these water and food systems? Sure, thank you so much, Peter. Um, and yeah, uh, this is, uh, to be honest, this is the end of my day. I'm sitting in Sri Lanka, in, uh, in Colombo, in Sri Lanka. I think I've been sitting 12 hours in this chair. It's been one of those kinds of days. And um, and I, I, was, I was just, you guys woke me up, uh, the, the previous speakers, I, I'm feeling, Really encouraged by the by the commitment and passion you all brought, you, the commitment you're bringing to to change and to innovation and to making it all work. Um, and and to be honest, that's one of the that's one of the big challenges as I see it is getting people to share to share that vision and to to share the sense of urgency that there is that there needs to be around. Uh, around water resources, around the water resources and the way they relate to risks in the food system. Uh, the sense of urgency that, that climate change means things are changing for, for water systems and food systems. Um, so, so how do we get, how do we get a broader community of, of people who don't come to conferences like this, who don't sit on panels like this, um, to, to, to better understand this this really simple fact, um, and that that because of that, um, some of the gravest threats to 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 global development are are because of water and to water, and that we don't we don't have if we don't have water security we don't have food security. We've got, to, we've got to get a broader community of people committed to that, that simple fact. Um, so how do we address it? What are the opportunities? Um, I think systems thinking is, is critical. It's a critical part of finding the right sorts of ways forward. 
I'm not sure I need to say very much more about systems thinking. Rorick's uh, expose of, of how we bring systems approaches to solving these kinds of complex problems uh, was, was absolutely brilliant. Um, but it is, it is, the challenge is bringing together these, these kinds of technological innovations alongside a whole different range of actors from different sectors, understanding that, that if we, if we work on, if we, if we work on these challenges as one system, um, that creates opportunities for, for the kind of change that Melissa, you were, you were pointing toward in, in your presentation just now. I mean, it also helps us, it also helps us to be able to address these kinds of the risks which are which are increasingly systemic. So this is the 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 opportunities to address those kinds of systemic risks, which goes back actually to the to one of the points that that Claudia spoke about in her comments in the video around the ways that water systems relate to food systems and thinking about that in terms of water supply to the food system, how water is used in food production, and now how how water relates to food consumption, and 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 it's within I think it's within that. That simple framework. When we look, when we look within that simple framework, that's that's where we find, that's where we, we find the solutions. That's where we find the, the systems we need to work on. So so three three kind of practical things that that uh, amongst many, but three kind of practical things that we can focus focus on as we do that. One is around water storage, um, and and actually as an opportunity here to I misspoke in the video. I said I said the freshwater storage uh, had declined worldwide. Um, in the, since the 1970s by 15 billion cubic meters. It's actually 15,000 billion cubic meters. So I was, uh, I was, it's, so I was, it's trillion, not billion. All right. Um, but, um, so, so water storage is, is a big part of uh, uh, the way forward to addressing these challenges, but doing so with a really strategic approach that combines um, the, 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 the natural storage with built storage, with underground storage, and, and doing that in a strategic way in the particular context with the particular kinds of water uses that you need to address. So changing the approach on that. Uh, second is around irrigation. So mm -hmm. if, as we expand irrigation in places where water risks are rising, that should help us build resilience. But we do that in a context where um, where global assessments say that in future, we, we, we will need to contemplate retreat of irrigation from, from some uh, regions of the world, from some geographies in the world. And that creates uh, big challenges for financing, big challenges for, for policy. Um, but, but we know that, for example, in Africa, there are, um, there's a big uh, unfilled gap in, 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 in meeting the, in, in using the potential for irrigation expansion. So, so how do we do that uh, in, in ways that are going to be productive and sustainable um, and, and help people be resilient and help people uh, move out of poverty in the way that also has to be part of all of these considerations? Um, and then the final point is around wastewater, um, a critical opportunity there. We know that worldwide wastewater treatment is, is nowhere near what it should be. A small percentage of, of wastewater gets treated worldwide. Um, and, and it should be seen, of course, as a precious resource um, that we can use uh, in indeed return to food production in places that are, are very dry when it's managed and treated in the right sorts of way. So making that part of our, part of our, um, part of our innovation uh, to take forward how we address these risks. So let me stop there, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, Harkamal, what do you what are you excited about? What do you see as the opportunities being in, in this space? Yeah, I, uh, I think that the uh, listening to all the speakers, you know, I think the opportunity exists in integration of a lot of data. Um, I think the uh, you know, right now there's a lot of data being collected and it's not sort of you know converging to a point where you can make decisions. So that's something that I think uh, in the future, there's a good uh, opportunity to work on that. And, and then again, you know, we also need to understand that the inherent nature of, uh, of weather and food production, and hence water, uh, you know, there's a probability. You know, it's, it's not a given that this would be a dry year or, or the next year would be a very wet year. So how do you turn those probabilities uh, in your decision making into a trust you know, which a very large scale farmer and a very small holder farmer and everyone in between can accept that this is 
you know, a good decision-making tool, and there is a, a level of trust that is based on probability. So that integration, uh, I think it's both uh, an opportunity as well as a challenge. Thank you, Harkamal. Anne, um, maybe Anne, uh, Anne and Aaron, uh, uh, from the perspective of, of yourselves, what do you see as the, the, the big opportunities? Yeah, I'll jump in here. Um, you know, I spoke on the wi wider, broader picture of the work that USFRA is doing earlier. But let me take it down to the farm level now, because I am a, a producer here in Nebraska, as well as Roy, who did an amazing job showing us how many decisions we have to make every day from all these different inputs. But we're talking about water. So on our farm here in Nebraska, we have about 10 center pivot irrigation systems. So there is, like Roik said, the innovation is there, but the adaption is slow. And there's a lot of reasons why that adaption is slow. But let's look at um, the irrigation we do on our farm. So um, we know the innovation is there. We, could, we would love to uh, upgrade all of our irrigation systems to variable rate irrigation, which would save hundreds of thousands of gallons of water a year where the sprinkler system um, you know takes all that data that we have in agriculture and waters where it's needed takes those those maps that we have and um, you know waters where it needed well we are a, we are a small family farm and um, a, a, to purchase a new irrigation, a center pivot irrigation system with all this new technology would cost $100,000. And we have 10 of them. That's a million dollar investment for a small family farm. It's just not feasible. So there seems to be this new interest in, you know, that this is a societal um, benefit, you know, to conserve water. But we have to have it be a return on investment you know, because we've got we've got so many other decisions to make, you know, our, our nutrient management, our seed decisions, our genetics, all of those. So water is one of those decisions. But, um, you know, we're talking about is there investment outside investment interested in helping us you know, utilize some of these newer technologies? These are questions um, for the future. Um, and I'll turn it over to Aaron to talk in that broader <clears throat> sense of the ag industry as a whole. Yeah, I think that um, everyone did such a great job really speaking to the innovation that's needed. So I, there's two takeaways when I think of the opportunities. Number one, science can, right? So for the first time, we now know that we, we have these an unbelievable genetics that we can sequence. We're now learning the power of our soils and our soils can be, right, that sequestering carbon sink, but also be that water resilient resource um, to really improve that water cycle. So we are at the frontiers of that science and it's accelerating every single day. We need a lot more investment in this science. And the second thing that gets me so excited about the opportunities, and you heard from Rourke and Ann, is that our farmers can too. They have a long list of things that they want to do on their farm. They know how to make these climate smart um, solutions on their farm. The barriers to success is how fast the science is getting in their hands and how fast the investment is supporting, number one, the asset infrastructure build. And the second is new risk uh, mitigation tools as they really are truly out there weathering the storm in the real effects of climate change. So, you know, um, when I think about the two things that are absolutely critical, these are part of our action tracks. Number one is getting the business intelligence of climate smart decision making in their hands. You heard Rourke talk a little bit about that. Everyone's coming out with these new ideas. We did a report. We know how many startups they're failing because it requires integrated data sets at scale like the Human Genome Project. That is critical to get mobilized. So we can have an innovation and let uh, innovators do what they do best to support our farmers. We need to move from business intelligence and climate smart decision making and practicing to allow our farmers to also see climate sense making predictive models of nitrogen cycling, carbon cycling and water cycling with extreme and episodic events between five and 10 years. And then finally, um, really make certain 
that ESG investment is looking at agriculture as the number one place. It's now at 12 trillion and growing, 28% per annum. The investors continually look at renewable energy as the sector to invest in. But we know when it comes to climate, when it comes to water, when it comes to communities and food security, it has to start with our farms. So getting that investment right for our farmers, as Ann was talking about that pivot pump, we know we can do creative climate bonds. Um, last year, there was 10 billion in climate bonds and not one was singularly was addressed in agriculture. This, we have to make certain that the private sector is at the table really to partner with and for our farmers for climate smart outcomes and looking at food security as truly national security. And that I would, I would wager is a universal thing. Um, it was front and center. If you guys uh, heard Ann's comments and all of our farmers comments at the UN Food System Summit, we must have science, we must have innovation, and we must have new forms of investment now for this next decade. And for, for our wider audience, can you just explain what you mean by ESG? Sorry, yes. So Environmental Social Governance Fund is, is a new type of investor that's really coming at the table with baby boomers, uh, retiring. You know, they don't need those um, higher returns. And they tend to be asking questions like, you know, I want to put my money to good. Um, so what are you doing for the community? What are you doing for the planet? And then you have this other Gen Z and millennial investor as well that have come along and really said, you know, I want to put my money to work for good. Um, so it is now the fastest growing investment pool. Um, if you if you want to um, make sure you're staying on top of this, follow Larry Fink, um, who's written some wonderful um, articles to Wall Street that is really challenging all financial to institutions to take more of a decadal approach. Uh, as you can imagine, this is a major change in how uh, institutional investors are looking at investment. But we do see this as a positive shift to start looking at environmental, social, and governance outcomes as it relates to financial investment. And so we're, we really think that agriculture could be truly part of that solution for that financial investor that is really looking uh, to make a long-term impact uh, on both the planet and communities. Thank you, thank you. Rorick, what are you specifically excited about in this space? I promise to keep it brief since I uh, challenged my time slot, uh, Peter. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to wear my farmer hat for about 20 seconds here is sign me up uh, across all of these conversations about all of these challenges and and uh, not only would I would I would I enjoy uh, being a part of that, but also finding like minded and uh, a broader scale of uh, producers that can sit at that table from all aspects uh, um, and, and be able to take what we know and, and what makes the most sense and be able to help guide that. I think you're, you're hearing from Aaron and Ann from that perspective and, and uh, I also sit on the Nature Conservancy's uh, trustee board in Nebraska and, and I wanted to understand what the NGO environmental um, questions were, but more importantly, I wanted to be able to help guide those. That's what excites me is, is this, this idea around taking the time for me to meet Melissa, where she is in her group and Mark, uh, and understand where they are, but also concurrently uh, them taking the time, you know, from my perspective as well too. That excites me the most because that's where change will come from. That I believe is fundamentally the part that, that uh, from these 30,000 feet global forums and, and how, do we, how do we make those connectors? Is that through our land grant system? Is that through our global outreach places? Um, that's why I stepped away from our own operation daily is let my son make his own choices and be informed in a different way about building his own operation and that I can concurrently be able to spend that time and, and invest more of, of that piece with me. I'm, I'm excited about that part. Is this, is a, this is a tiny part of what all of us are involved with. And, and uh, it interests me uh, to the point that, that um, how do we do this? Um, uh, I, 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 I can't tell you, I could, I could spend another hour telling you what we're doing on our own farm to try and tell that story. And, but also help develop a template of success 
to, so that you on, on that side of the, of the discussion can take it and, and, and say, how do, we, how do we integrate all of these things into that discussion about water? I can tell you right now today, I'm using 40% less water than I was 10, well, 15 years ago. And in the last two years, I'm, I'm saving even 10% more. But, but I, I am operating on a precipice uh, in terms of meeting the crop irrigation demands and growing that crop, not only responsibly, but in a continuous improvement model. I don't want to be sustainable. And you can, I'll go on record with that. I, I don't want to be sustainable. I want to continue to improve every day that, 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 that even sets aside those, those pieces of expectations of those words. And that's what excites me about this and, and where we're headed. I, I, I am, sign me up. I, I started with that and I'll end with that. Thank you, Rorik. It's great to hear that. Um, Melissa, uh, if you, uh, what is excite, where do you see the opportunities here? And perhaps just to get onto a, another question is reflecting on the Food Systems Summit, what you've been involved in, oh, was water know, in there? I want to answer what? this one. I, I, can I, before we move over to the Food System Summit, I do want to answer that, especially given everyone else's remarks, if that's okay. And I, I have bulleted statements, I'll be quick. No, that's fine. Okay. I, um, I really, what every others resonated, what others said really resonated. And I am um, just the three things I, uh, that's really exciting to me um, and picking up on some themes from others. I think one is that we are, we have an existential crisis, right? I think um, these are things that excite me and also keep me up at night. And I think the edge of that is, is, is healthy tension. So we have an existential crisis happening in here at home in the US when, you know, 75% of the Western United States is under severe drought and having challenges, uh, you know, the, the highest ever recorded uh, rates of precipitation, water storage capacity in our dam, you know, reservoirs, et cetera. And then we have this thing playing out globally too. So never let a good crisis go to waste, especially when it forces people to reckon with some existential questions. And so Mark, I think your question about how do we get that sense of urgency, we should be taking the opportunity now to then mobilize. And so this brings me to my second point around, it does need collective action. It's really hard, water especially. And so climate is where we have this moment where we're trying as a planet and as a people to have collective action on that. And that is so much simpler than water. Um, and, and we have at least a place where we make these commitments and targets and have accountability. And so through food systems, I think you get to the water, but also through the Convention on Biological Diversity, you could get to water. So I think what we need, and Rorick, I just wanted to pick up on your theme, we do need to create a shared vision. We, we don't need to be in silos anymore. And this existential crisis forces people to come out of their entrenched positions and start to talk to each other and find what that shared vision is. I do think we really want the same things from conservation and from agriculture. We want you guys to succeed. I wanna feed my kids breakfast. I don't have, you know, I, food production is so, so critical. So shared vision, uh, but aligned incentives and then scaled change and impact and really driving what those solutions should be and then aligning public private incentives to do it. And the last one I really wanna pick up on Aaron and others is we know and need data, the technologies, but I do think we need to set the rules of the road on what the limits are we're trying to achieve. Uh, we have a science-based targets agenda through climate change. We have an IPCC that sets what is needed towards action to get to a 1.5 degree future. We need to develop that for other things like water. And that's what's happening through the science-based targets network for fresh water. It's where corporate engagement is happening and sort of we need to have some clarity and aligned uh, understanding about you know, what those boundary conditions are. And then to your point work, once you know, then you innovate the heck out of it. You need to make sure it works for your bottom line. We need then to apply all the tools to support farmers in that transition and in success from your economic standpoint, as well as from all the other requirements they're forced to now operate under. So there, Peter, back to you. <laughs> Thank you, Melissa. Well, then I'll go back to the top then, Mark. I, I, I don't know what, and this to each of the speakers, to what extent you were following the, the Food System Summit and engaged, but in terms of how water was incorporated in there, perhaps just what more can we be doing to really incorporate the water into these agricultural discussions? Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, 
yeah, if I'm honest, uh, I, I was I was not totally enthusiastic about the way water was addressed in the Food System Summit. Food System Summit, of course, has done some good things and it's moved done some very good things and it's moved the conversation around uh, food systems and agriculture and all that that encompasses uh, forward in a really major way. Um, um, and it had a, you know, out of that comes some some coalitions uh, for for action, and those need to be mobilized. Um, it, in the statement statement of action um, it, uh, that came from the UN Secretary General, um, it talked about um, the impossible uh, it, that, that it's, it will be impossible to sustainably manage water resources uh, without agriculture, and that is of course totally true. Um, but the reverse is also true, and this is what I think was was rather missing from from the way the the, the dialogue around the food system summit emerged. The reverse is also true. Um, so if, if there is not water security uh, at a systems level, then food systems face face really major risks. Um, and that, uh, as we've seen with with climate change and the climate report, that's only that's only getting uh, that those risks are only being amplified. Um, so the food system summit, I, I do think, really really underplayed that. Um, so there were some gaps, um, and um, uh, I, I think that um, the the IPCC report, as I said, it, it made that really clear that that there are significant risks that need to be need to be part of that conversation. I really like there was an article in the Washington Post this week that said very clearly that the world needs to wake up on water. Um, so so these, maybe these messages they are they are bubbling up and and emerging uh, more strongly. Um, but I think the bottom line is that any discussion on food systems and on food systems transformation, it, it needs to address uh, water risks. Otherwise, we're, we're making a mistake and we're leaving people, um, we're leaving people vulnerable to those risks. Um, I think to make, to take the food systems summit and the momentum it's created forward, I just wanted to pick up on Rorick's point um, yeah, those those kinds of processes they live at thirty thousand feet, um, but the critical challenge is to make change happen, um, and that means getting down to the ground. It means um, it means working across scales. I think organisations like mine, the CGIR and IMI, that's part of our role is to help help um, help people and governments and communities uh, work across scales to 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 make the the. The kind of commitments and momentum and and um, and and um, uh, uh, drive for innovation that that emerged out of the food systems to make that really drive change um, uh, that that makes the differences that we're going to need. So, Peter, thank you, Mark. Mark Kamal. Yeah, I would agree with what Mark mentioned. I think uh, water and temperature are inherently tied with uh, with the food system. I did see, observe that there was more temperature increase than water sustainability in the summit. But generally, I agree with what Mark's, uh, you know, said it are very uh, insightful comments. Anne and Aaron, you're both very involved, uh, as, as uh, I think as uh, anybody could be in, in this process. What, what are, are your reflections in terms of uh, the water and how that was managed in there? Um, I, I would say, and then Ian, I'd love you to talk about the kind of the conclusion with farmers being at the table. But um, you know, it started out really as a diet-based conversation, and I think um, it, it quickly moved more to like the real, more food security and how do we begin to really look at the real adaptation and the ability to grow food, um, and and really trying to get back to that idea of the zero hunger. Um, which of course includes nutritious diets as well as part of that, but really looking at the real resiliency that is going to be needed within this sector as a fundamental basis of food security. Um, and I think there's three major outcomes that we, we saw. Um, we participated in um, 28 different dialogues. Uh, we hosted the um, only independent farmer only, which Ann can talk about, uh, independent dialogue and World Farmers Organization did as well. Um, up until June, really, farmers weren't front and center into the conversation. Uh, and we worked really hard to make certain that farmers were front and center in the conversation with 2 billion farmers worldwide. 
as we start to think about the real impacts of climate change and the, the questions that are being asked, they need to be seen as an authentic partner and have their own agency inside the UN. So um, starting in July, um, uh, about two weeks before the pre-summit, uh, farmers were officially invited into that forum. And we saw the dialogue really change, um, really to get science rapidly into their hands. You know, we saw this like, need for genetics, this need for soil science uh, starting to emerge, this idea of integrated um, solutions on the farm. So really uh, work, I would say, trying to get it from the 30,000 feet to what does it mean to me as a farmer uh, in these different countries all over the world. And then, of course, we heard universally from farmers that there needs to be investment and authentic partnership at the table. So really excited uh, that while we were together in Rome, uh, I think that the farmers, you know, working with and for the farmers changed that conversation. And what we saw then at the General Assembly, um, at the close of the, the pre-summit, uh, you heard when, when people have no voice and they feel that they're not being heard, they deserve a seat at the table. And what we saw in the uh, General Assembly for the first time, that farmers are now going to be included in the permanent uh, advisory seat of the council on part. There's a NGO seat, there's a business seat, there's an indigenous seat, and there's a youth seat and a woman's seat, but there had not been previously uh, farmers invited into that conversation. So I see that as a real um, opportunity to move it from this 30,000 feet into what's really needed on the ground. And uh, you participated, so just give give your thoughts. Yeah, I think that uh, is so true what you said, that farmers are working in the reality of growing food and dealing with all these things. And then the UN just looks like it's at 30,000 feet with all these ideas that don't make sense. And so often we have not been part of that. Um, I will just say that, you know, it was a two year process and under Erin's leadership, she saw the importance and the vision of working toward having that permanent seat so that when policies come down, they need to make sense and they need to make sense on our farms. Um, so uh, we continue to try to be that voice um, and it's a continuous process and Aaron has partnered with farmer organizations around the world to try to bring that um, idea that innovation and technology will help us be more sustainable and that that's how we can utilize our resources to the fullest and to the best ability. But uh, yeah, it's, it's constantly a challenge to bring it back to the farm and have it make sense. Um, but I think our clear message is, has been that farmers have to have that voice and that it's through technology and innovation that we can accomplish the goals that everyone's looking for. So those have been important um, pieces there. And I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you, Ron. Rorick? I wasn't a part of that, but let me just let me take it even step down to Nebraska and my involvement even at the legislative level with the Nebraska Department of Natural Resources, with the Nebraska Association of, of, of uh, NRD districts, natural resource districts who are in charge of the groundwater. But when you think about um, and, those, and those are locally elected and typically producer uh, governed boards uh, for their portions of the basin. But, but a lot of things didn't change in Nebraska until there was a, a, um, a determination made by Fish and Wildlife that there were some challenges with the surface water uh, species, uh, four of them in particular in Nebraska, birds and fish that, that uh, needed some uh, attention in terms of their environmental uh, habitats and in the absence of, of, of producers, uh, a lot of the meetings were scheduled around harvest and planting time. And so we always joked about uh, if there was ever a time that a producer needed to have a voice or it needed to be a part of it uh, and being respectful. And it's the same way if, if I schedule something around what, what you do. And and, 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 and what I'm trying to ask or, or talk about here is, is, is how do we again meet each other where we are and see it through our eyes, but also be able to, to, to be able to talk in that context about 
that collaboration, that transparency, and that that vision that exists. It exists at the farm level in varying degrees. My son has a different vision for our operation than my 38 years of vision to where we are today. And so um, th- that advocacy uh, from Aaron and Ann's seat uh, to what Melissa and Mark and others on the call uh, talk about, uh, let, let's, let's lean into that. Let's build that. Let's build that out to where we can connect the acre. Um, I'm working on two different projects with the university of Nebraska, uh, called smart farm and then farm of the future. And, and the land grants are even struggling because producers themselves, we produce so much data and we're all these, so nutrient and Simplot and all these huge providers are now have a new solution. And, and how do you, how do you take that and, and, and hand that off to, to someone else that says, Hey, these exist to, to help, you know, change and influence decisions. So I, 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 uh, I think every one of these has an opportunity for us to broaden that network that, that, that can make change and make it the right thing to do. Thank you, Rorick. Melissa, you were actively involved. What did you see from your perspective? Yeah, and I, I'll say my colleague who leads our global food practice was uh, actively involved and then our U.S. team was in a support role. Um, I took these slides out of my presentation, but I'll just use them here and give a little framing for, this was the five action tracks in, in, that led up to the summit, um, safe and nutritious food, sustainable consumption, nature positive production, equitable livelihoods, and then the resilience piece. And then this was the 12 solution clusters that we came up with, with all of the colleagues. It wasn't just WWF under the protect, manage and restore. And what I wanted to show is this is where water showed up in the process. You know, there was a water theme and then it of course would show up in like blue foods. It would, you know, show up in uh, regenerative ag. You would hope it would show up. You would hope in uh, things like resilience and climate. Um, but this is now how they reorganized and taking the summit tracks forward. They have reorganized into five different tracks. And these bullets are just exemplary, not exhaustive of the different very specific work streams that different members of these coalitions are moving forward. And I know you can't read it all, it's kind of small and there isn't a lot of time, but I just, my takeaway is that water kind of got lost. While we at least had one bullet before, water is now, you would hope, going to be mentioned somewhere in regen ag or agroecology. It's hopefully going to be called out somewhere in the soil hub and or climate and biodiversity, et cetera, and you know, finance efforts, et cetera. Um, and so I think the thing that I, I wanted to mention in that is that I think how this translates, I think there is an awareness and elevated um, idea where water fits in, but the specific actions and what to be done to support the producers is not clear. Um, and that Regen Ag is a lot of discussion around sinking carbon and carbon sequestration and the link to climate. It's not as much about the structure of soil, soil water management, water holding capacity, nutrient management, all the other benefits that you've heard Rorick talk about so eloquently about why farmers are adopting these different practices. And then how do farmers get credit for it and potentially payments or their incentives whether it's through public sector mechanisms of TA support, transition risk, you know, programs, or through the private sector and market mechanisms that would support them uh, in, in delivering these kinds of things for the collective good. They should get rewarded for it. In addition to it should be part of their bottom line and they should still produce food. So right now, if we're only talking about carbon, that's a problem. And, and I feel like that's one thing, you know, we, we should be, again, elevating the importance of the water story when we think of, uh, of regenerative ag, as well as linking the finance and investment. Um, and then the other piece, let me just add, is that, you know, I think technology is important and it's incredible what farmers and producers are doing, but it's not the only answer and it's not the silver bullet. And I, there's Jevons Paradox, FAO, EMI and others have published a series of case studies from around the world showing that when you just had water saving efficient technology like drip, uh, it did not necessarily translate to better water efficiency in the environment in the bigger scope. It just led to more water consumption and drove more environmental challenges. And so technology alone and water use efficiency is not uh, is, is necessary, but not sufficient. 
Um, and then I think the other piece is that we need to have metrics and data and technology to look at performance based outcomes at the landscape level, in addition to the field level. And there's so much interesting stuff being done with satellite, LIDAR, radar imagery, coupled with modeling that can, can now uh, allow us to embed this. And, and you know, the finance sector and corporates are leading the way, frankly, and embedding just as they are with climate portfolios, and responsibilities, TCFD, TNFD. Um, the transparency for climate uh, financial disclosures and now the transparency for nature financial disclosures should include water, but it's not clear how and where water will be included at this point. Thanks. Thank you, Melissa. So I'm not going to go to some specific questions if, if uh, just uh, I'll open it up to the speakers to, to address. Might name one or two of you to see if you can, can answer them, but uh, basically they're coming from, the, from our uh, audience. And, and, and one that there's two or three questions around how can we, uh, ha, with smallholder farmers in Sub-Saharan Africa, in South Asia, many of the billions of farmers that were just mentioned before, how can we there, and they're also the ones that are going to be most impacted by climate change, how do we include them in the, these processes? How do they get involved in this, uh, this, this, uh, this uh, getting more people to the table? Any, any thoughts on that, um, Mark perhaps, or, or Harkamal? Or, or Melissa, given previous chapters in your career? I'm happy to kick off, uh, Peter. Um, I think the, the, the crucial starting place for answering that um, is something that we've talked a little bit about uh, in this session, but, but is crucially important, so and so does need some more airing, which is governance, water governance, um, and making sure that the, that the institutions that are at work uh, to help help people manage water well and manage water sustainably and and help farmers uh, do that well. Um, that those are working locally and they're set up locally and they're they're connected up to 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 the decisions that are made at higher scales. Um, and so smallholder farmers need to be part of that. Um, they need to be they need to be part of the 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 the. the the dialogue and discussion and negotiation of what are we going to do to to make our community more resilient uh, to to the climate to the climate changes, and to do that well, they need data, um, and so the kinds of um, the kinds of data that we've we've seen seen in the session today that needs to be. Uh, tailored and delivered into those forums for those kinds of uh, users to help them make the kinds of decisions that they need to make um, in, in relation to the risks that they face this year and in five years and in 10 years. Um, and, and so part of that data challenge that goes alongside the, the innovation and technology is making sure data is usable uh, and applicable in, uh, for the different kinds of users, including smallholder farmers working in those governance mechanisms. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Anybody else would like to interject? I think this is something we, we, we also need to uh, give further thought to this. Um, in, in terms of, uh, another, this is a very specific question. It's really following up on what you were saying, Mark. It probably then comes back to you. But I, I want to, just in terms of some of the audience we have, this is from Eastern Congo, uh, uh, the question. And, and the, the, the point being asked here is it's a post-conflict zone natural resource management stru structures are deeply disorganized. What, what can be done or what are the, the thoughts on, on managing water resources in, in those contexts? Maybe just a quick answer to that. It's a large topic in fragile zones, Mark, but any quick thoughts for our audience there? Um, yeah, this draws upon a past life, but I think it's uh, solve real problems. So yeah. what are the real problems on the ground that, that those communities are facing, those, those groups are facing? work on those problems, solve them, and then, then try and connect them up. Thank you, Mark. That's great. Um, there's all, another question here that I, I will open up to the panel if there's thoughts on this. It's, it's actually was asked in the context of Nebraska, but what, what, what is the opportunity for uh, uh, off-grid uh, electricity systems for, for managing irrigation and pumping the water? Uh, I, I think that has a particular question here in Nebraska, but, but also globally, it's, it's an interesting, an important question. Well, it, it, Peter, just real quickly, I, it, that's an evolving uh, relationship that, that, you know, there's such a diverse uh, set of, of, 
of operational metrics that that has to meet. And, you know, are we talking about a, a small well to a large well to, you know, are we talking about small acreages? I mean, uh, but, but it exists. Uh, load control is probably the biggest one right now is with the tools that are available today, we've gone from one or two days of voluntary load control to seven days. So that's nearly half the week that uh, we can manage our, our irrigation withdrawals with uh, just based off of the sensors and the tools that help us, genetics uh, that help us do that. So, I mean, there, there's lots in that space going on. I apologize, my Basset Hound has decided to talk to me <laughs> right now. <laughs> But I, there, there's a lot going on in that space, and, and I'm glad to expand on that, but there is a lot. Thank you, Rorik. Any other thoughts on that? Well, one, one more general question that really uh, is uh, what we've been talking about that I think is significant is how receptive and welcoming are, are, the, are the ones at the policy level? How receptive are the policymakers to this? We've talked about sort of some shifting patterns and, and some more receptivity, but what are your thoughts on the, the receptivity and perhaps working with the, 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 the decision makers going forward? Peter, just again real quick, I, I, think, I think we're remiss if we don't spend the time to inform them and give them the same opportunities to understand across the whole scope, the whole system from what Mark and Melissa and, and Ann and Aaron all, and everyone else are concerns with all the way down to the producer and taking the time to do that. Uh, there is a change inside of our own legislature in Nebraska and, and the, the expectations that come with that on resource and, and the, our stewardship you know, accountability. So uh, I, 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 am, I, I think that's the big effort is how do we get better science? How do we get better involvement and be able to tell our story appropriately so that better, better decisions and policy can be made. Thank you, Rorik. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I think uh, this This is uh, Aaron. We, we don't do policy per se um, by design. Uh, we fundamentally believe that there's a lot of policy kind of conversations going on, but this is gonna take public private partnership uh, to really advance some of these conversations um, and dedicated investment and innovation. So uh, we did a report earlier this year um, about transformative investment, trying to help put uh, the dollars uh, around this. There's about $972 billion in private sector investment in agriculture. To give you an idea of the government spending, that's about 15 billion. If you imagine ecosystem service markets, that would be about 12 to 15, both of carbon and nitrogen trade. So our point here in this conversation is to say, like, if we really imagine what the next 10 years and the capital infrastructure needed to transform agriculture, just here in the United States, I have a feeling that the dollars need to come from somewhere else. So we must grow private sector investment in this sector and um, just really encourage new forms of innovation and investment in the technology and the support structures for our farmers that will come from the private sector. And even if we grew that grew private sector investment by 1%, we would already eclipse federal savings. So I think we just need to make certain that we think about stackable investment solutions for our farmers. Imagine what they're really faced with during harvest season as they make their next planting season. They get the numbers in. What is it going to take to make that investment truly on their farm for the following season? What risk models are needed? And bring that finance to the table for our farmers to make decisions now. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, we are fast running out of time here. The two hours have, have flown by. Um, I just want to wrap up. There's one more question I, I w wanted to ask, but uh, I, I will have to phrase it more as a, a, a resolution amongst the, the panel members in terms of uh, how can this, the membership, the people on this panel work together to, uh, to, to find solutions to food systems and water challenges. I think we just have to resolve that this is certainly this, this idea that we were hearing that we need more people at the table in this conversation, more of the producers to really take this, this forward. But ultimately, we really have to work with the producers on the ground for, for outcomes. I, it's a very broad wrap up of all this very rich discussion, but it's, it's, been a, it's a, certainly been a productive uh, two hours. Uh, I'd like to thank all of, of the, 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 the panelists and the speakers uh, 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 for, for being here with us today, and, and particularly Mark, who's, it's getting 
well into the night there in, in Sri Lanka. Uh, your, the thoughtful responses and the time you took in preparing these presentations for this session. I, I would really like to thank the producers, both Anne and Rorick, because this is a very critical time of the season in, in terms of harvesting and equipment breakdowns and all the challenges. That, that this is not, this is not a, a low-stress profession. It has been a very fruitful discussion on the interconnectedness of food systems and water. I think on the realities of it all and the, the, the challenges around the world. Thank you all for joining us today. You will see a poll up now asking you to provide feedback on your experience. Your response helps us to continue to get better and further improve, uh, improve these sessions. What, just, uh, there, there is a, a, a three more weeks of different sessions. There was questions around farmer-led irrigation. I, I encourage you to tune in next week for the deeper discussions on farmer-led irrigation. If you had not done so already, I highly recommend you watch the on-demand session, Integrating Nutrition in Irrigation Investments. This was made available earlier this week, and it's very relevant to this session, and it brings in more of the small farmers' voices into this discussion. Also, check out the forum schedule for our other upcoming live and on-demand sessions this month. And in the meantime, you can join us on Slack at the link in the chat box to continue this conversation. If you missed any part of this, the session will be archived in the On Demand tab shortly, and, I, and I'd encourage you to view some of the other On Demand sessions as well. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you all.